Welcome inside with the insiders. Tom Pellicero, that's Ian Rappaport, that is Mike Garofolo. Already four weeks down in this NFL season. They added the 17th game, so we can't call this the quarter poll anymore. Any of those chunks the coaches like to break it up to. Doesn't work, but guess what? We've got plenty of news to talk about anyway here. Let's start out in Pittsburgh. Ian, you had the news last night that the Steelers were expected to go with Kenny Pickett. They made that official in the way that the Steelers announced news now, which is putting out a depth chart with him listed as the number one quarterback. Take me inside what went into this decision, if there was really any decision at all after they benched Mitch Trubisky at halftime last week. Well, first of all, the fact that the Steelers have now taken to announcing moves by just dropping the depth chart is hilarious. It's also very college football. Like, that's kind of what happens. Like, when I covered Alabama, the release of the depth chart was a legitimately, like, important day. And it was everyone's main story. So this kind of brought me back. This was kind of nice. Um, this was the obvious move. And, you know, it's always everybody wants to break a story. And it's nice. it was nice last night to be able to say it and whatever. But, like, if we're being real, I think everybody thought this was happening anyway because once you go to the guy, once you go to Kenny Pickett, and I think everyone knows, Mike, that this guy is the future, you can't go back. You can't say, all right, you're going to play half. Ah, oh, you weren't good enough. We're actually going to go back to Trubisky. It's a never-ending cycle that you just, you know, is bad for everyone. So they unlocked some Kenny Pickett. He is now going to start. They love him. I thought, Mike, you did a really nice job in NFL now of, discussing why, uh, but as Tom has said in something that has been captured on multiple promos, the future is now, and I'm excited to see it. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Appreciate that. Um, uh, thanks. Good to know you were watching on your off day, too. That's really good. Um, well, I wasn't yeah, watching. Was I, was, I watched the internet clip, but it was good. I, I was joking. I know you weren't watching. Uh, there was that oh. throw that we just saw from uh, Kenny Pickett where uh, Quinn and Williams was bearing down on him, and he was able to deliver a strike for uh, 18 yards and a first down on third and eight from the 20. Uh, that, you know, th those are the plays. Those are the moments that they're talking about. Uh, go back to Mike Tomlin saying this summer, when he stepped inside the stadiums for preseason games, the moment was not too big for him. Um, those are the kind of things that they've seen from Kenny Pickett dating back to the spring. I mean, it helped that he was basically in the same building that he was in in college. He didn't have to move. So that leads to a level level of comfortability, but then you see how he responds in certain situations like live preseason games where we've seen some rookie struggle at times. No, he responded well. And then you see him get into the game uh, this past Sunday and you see a 300 and whatever pounder bearing down on him and he still makes the throw. <laughs> Oh, okay, so, the, yeah, there were three interceptions. I, some people were tweeting about that. This guy's terribly threw it. If that's what you're taking out of Sunday's game and everything we've seen from Kenny Pickett so far, you're missing the bigger picture. It's a guy that has shown flashes and shown that uh, he is willing to hang in there and have the mental makeup that it takes to be a quarterback in the NFL. And I've seen this happen before. You know, he may play marginally better than Mitchell Trubisky, but it may be – that spark that Mike Tomlin is looking for just by, okay, here's the young guy. Here's the guy that we know is going to be here for the long haul. All of a sudden, everything starts to pick up a little bit. That's what Mike Tomlin is hoping for in this case. Might be tough to have that uh, result in a victory in Buffalo on Sunday, but uh, it, it's not a one-season thing for the Steelers and Kenny Pickett. It's a long-term thing, and, and Sunday could be the beginning of it. Just thinking through this situation, too, for Kenny Pickett, his first – start in the NFL is going to be in Buffalo, where we know the type of environment that is, against a Bills offense that even though there have been some rocky moments in the past couple of weeks here, is really, really good. You know you're going to have to score some points. It's a lot of pressure in that situation, which raises the question, why not just start Mitch Trubisky again? This is your one opportunity if you want to go back to him, because right now it was just a substitute situation last week. And one person familiar with the situation told me, the moment that you make that move to pick it, if you were to put Trubisky back out there, all the other players are looking around wondering, when is it going to happen again? It just changes the dynamic so much here, so yeah. not a surprise. The Steelers are going to move forward with the rookie. Let's talk about another team that's wait, going to I, wait, have a different starting I, quarterback let me, this week. Let me week just say that, one more thing. Yeah, go ahead. Hang on. Let me sure, just say one more thing. This is what I'm – sorry. Yeah, well, I, we're fine. Um, I'm so interested in Kenny Pickett because it was such a weird year of quarterbacks where he went earliest and he went 20th. And if he's really good, and I think there are certainly some people in the Steelers organization who think he's going to be really good, it's going to force us to look at all the teams that didn't take him and then why. And, like, it creates 
it, it's just, it makes the whole thing, it lets us be able to examine this whole thing differently if he's really good. So anyway, that's what I'm looking forward to seeing. Go ahead, Tony. Thanks, glad we got that in for you there, Ian. Uh, moving on to the Dolphins. Obviously, they're going to have a different starting quarterback this week. It's going to be Teddy Bridgewater. Hang on one second. got to answer the phone. Sorry. Right, stop. I'll take over. It's fine. No, I got you. I'll do it. The Dolphins are going to have a different starting quarterback this week. It's going to be Teddy Bridgewater. Meanwhile, let's just leave Tom's open chair there uh, to let everyone know that he just bailed on the show. Okay, it's just being Mike and I. Anyway, Tua Tagovailoa is going to be interviewed uh, by NFL officials. That is happening today on Tuesday, October 4th, as the investigation continues into the concussion protocol, how it was used, was everything proper, was everything done right. Obviously, the UNC has been fired, and the NFL and NFLPA are, are going over new protocols uh, to eliminate players from the field, take players off the field who exhibit some of that gross motor instability. Meanwhile, uh, Tua is still in the concussion protocol. Obviously, Mike, we all know there was no way he was going to play this week. So it's going to be Bridgewater, who I would say probably one of the best backups in the NFL, one of the most experienced. How much do you think this changes things for the Dolphins? Well, you've got a guy in Teddy Bridgewater who's got a reputation for being too careful with the football. And in this offense, they want to be taking their shots. Now, if a guy's deep and he's running free, that's one thing. But if you got to try to fit one in there, is Teddy going to be willing to kind of let it fly the way that Tua Tagovailoa has let it fly? I think that's the biggest question. Hi, Tom. That's the biggest question uh, from an X's and O's standpoint. Uh, as for this investigation, I've said from the beginning, I don't think it's going to uncover some Look kind of smoking gun at all. It's not like they're going to get somebody like under this. the bright lights and say, okay, you got me. Yeah, he was, he was concussed, but we, we threw him back in there because football, right? Like, you're not going to get that. You're also not going right. to get Tua saying, yeah, I was a little foggy there. I pretended it was my back, but you got me. It, it's it's going to be, and I still believe this, and, and we, we've talked about the potential protocol changes, uh, the, the protocol is the one on trial here. The protocol is the one being investigated, and that's why I think that that's right. you're going to have those changes to take out that subjectivity of, well, he was stumbling, but he tells us it was because of his back. Yeah, we believe him. He can go back in there. That won't be the case moving forward once these protocol changes are finalized. Tom, you ready? You good? Yeah, sometimes. There's a little behind the scenes for you. A lot of times your phone rings, and you think this is going to be a thing. We're going to have some news, and then you walk away for 30 seconds, and nope. Nothing happening, and hold tight, call you later. So thanks for that call. Uh, let's talk about one other thing that happened last night that actually was news, and really throughout the last 48 hours here, Javante Williams, the Broncos' promising young running back, suffering a torn ACL and additional damage. His season now over, and the Broncos did something that we don't see as much in the current NFL because the way the roster rules have evolved over the past few years through COVID, veterans being on practice squads, and you know the elevations that you can use, which is a significant player, at least a big-name player, being taken off of somebody's practice squad. In this case, it's Latavius Murray who gets signed by the Broncos off the Saints practice squad, now joins that room with Melvin Gordon and Mike Boone there in Denver. Saints fans went ballistic. Beyond anything I thought when so I tweeted bizarre. this news last night, in part because it seems like there's a lot of confusion about how this is Latavius Murray two days ago on Sunday running the football. He played really well in that game, scoring a touchdown for the Saints. And now, 24 hours later, he's a member of the Broncos. The answer is you can use these standard elevations up to three times on one player. But after the game, the player reverts to the practice squad at that point. They can terminate the contract and go someplace else, which is what Murray did. <laughs> he's got a relationship with the Broncos general manager, George Payton. Thought he's got more opportunity there. He now is going to be on the 53-man roster in Denver. And this is a Broncos team right now, Ian, that you look at what's happened to them so far in this season. They are, they've won a couple of games. They're not sitting there at 0-4, but we've talked about the Broncos for a lot of different reasons uh, so far this season, now you've got these injuries that are piling up, and Justin Simmons is out, yeah. and now Javante Williams is out. What, what do we make of the Broncos uh, moving forward here? Let me go back to the Latavius Murray thing, because you're right. I, this took me off guard, too. Like, I saw you tweet it, and I'm like, all right, like retweet, go back to whatever I was doing. And it really kind of blew up. And I didn't realize that Saints fans loved themselves some Latavius Murray. And I know he played well. I mean, we all watched the game. He looked 
pretty good, I thought, but he was a guy in the practice squad. So the Saints offered him a chance to stay on the 53-man roster, from my understanding. He turned it down to go to Denver. The reason why he turned it down was because he would basically be the fourth guy in uh, New Orleans because Alvin Kamara is going to come back probably soon, probably this week, although we'll see. Um, so his opportunity in, in New Orleans would be somewhat limited. Meanwhile, in Denver, he goes to a place where you right, he knows the GM. He also knows that Melvin Gordon, who's really talented and still really good, but had a huge costly fumble, another costly fumble this past week. Latavius Murray could get real and legitimate starter snaps in Denver. That's why he did it. That's why everybody cares, and Saints fans really lost their mind. As far as Broncos go, Mike, definitely the weirdest team in the NFL. Um, for a first-year coach, I think uh, Nathaniel Hackett's taken more, you know, whatever than anyone anticipated, and the season's only four days old, four games old. It's very strange. You think they're the weirdest team in the NFL? Um, listen, yes. their 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 quarterback Which would does you like some to odd videos. Uh, I, I haven't really thought about it, um, but their quarterback does some weird videos, so I could buy into that, and I think they're still trying to figure him out, that locker room there. Uh, it, it's a feeling out process. He looked, he looked better uh, to me this past week than I think he has the first couple of weeks. I, th I think he's starting to get into a little bit of a groove. Um, I understand they lost the game, and they could have used a little bit more of a groove to win the game, but uh, I, I feel like he's... I feel like he's close. I do. I mean, I just – you got to remember, you're used to a guy who was dropping the ball in the, in the bucket to Tyler Lockett for so many years. I mean, those guys had incredible sync. He doesn't have that with this receiving core right now. It, it feels like they're getting close, and, and Jerry Judy could maybe be that downfield guy. But they've misfired on a few throws over the uh, first, course, first quarter of the season, excuse me. So uh, that part's got to hit for me to be like, okay – there we go. Here come the Broncos. I haven't seen it yet, so they're not quite riding yet. So we got one quarterback change so far in the NFL. Pittsburgh going to the rookie Kenny Pickett. Who could be next? Let's talk about some of the situations coming up right after this on The Insiders. Since we're at that Almost quarter poll, whatever four divided by 17 is. Let's talk about some of the other quarterbacks who are in new places this season. We mentioned Russell Wilson. Obviously, the Broncos still going through a process here, as you would expect, with new head coach, new quarterback, new offense. But there was so much quarterback movement, guys, in this offseason. Let's examine a few of these other situations, none of which I would say, again, very early stage in the season, but not, have not necessarily worked out as well as some people would have liked. Ian, let's start with Indianapolis. Matt Ryan right now on pace to break the single-season fumble record, which I really had never uh, contemplated before. Obviously, the Colts won two and one. They have not won a game in their division despite playing three of them. What do we make of, of what's going on right now with Matt Ryan in that quarterback situation? So Ryan was quoted today as saying he thinks that the team is close, which is possible. I guess anything is possible. The fumbles are a major issue. Um, I can't believe it's that many. I mean, I've been watching and paying attention, obviously. That is so many. Uh, and some of it is like fumble luck, and I think the number will kind of come back to earth. But that really shows it an offensive ineptitude that is not really good. Here's the interesting thing here. There's nothing, nothing the Colts could do. He has two years fully guaranteed on his deal. He is their quarterback for the rest of this year. He's probably their quarterback for the rest of next year. And after a year of Carson Wentz, you know, this was another swing by the general manager, Chris Ballard. And early returns are not great. I think they, they have no choice but just run the heck out of the ball and try to get him to get rid of it faster. Interesting thing for me here, guys, is Matt Ryan was available. Everyone knew he was available. He's a quarterback that's taken a team to the Super Bowl. And I think everyone involved was stunned that there wasn't more interest. But the league sort of has a way of setting the market, and the interest was tepid at best, which I thought was crazy at the time. But now I kind of wonder, did all of the other evaluators know something that we all didn't? Really interested to see how this plays out in Indy. Well, if you remember, uh, you know, Matt Ryan certainly was hurt by the Falcons' interest in Deshaun Watson. But uh, it was also the ball was in his court as to whether he wanted to push his way out of there. And he said basically the Colts were the right situation, that he wouldn't have jumped for some other situations yeah, as well. Right. Um, so, I, you know, I, th I think that was part of it. And, and I think we all thought that 
it was going to be a lot smoother, the transition there to Indianapolis. And, oh, good, they've got themselves a quarterback that's more reliable. I, you know, the, the, the turnovers, I mean, the, beyond the fumbles, it's the interceptions. He's, he's, his interception rate, uh, and I lost it. I closed it out. I think it was 3.2%, which is the highest of his career, if I'm not mistaken. If I had the tab open, Jeez. I could confirm that. But I was looking over some stuff before we started talking about this. So um, it's it just the, the turnovers, period, are bad. And, Ian, you could say, yeah, fumble – fumble luck and these things have a way of evening themselves out it's guys not getting open so he can't throw the ball quickly enough and it's an offensive line that needs to be better that we we, we think is one of their stronger points and it really hasn't been so I think that's Should the be. frustrating part is it's not just Matt Ryan it's roster wide on a roster that we thought was strong from top to bottom and it's proven not to be the case so far is he in board I don't know what he's doing playing with a pen all of a sudden here not quite certain what's happening uh I Ian, you mentioned hour. Carson I Wentz play with something. <laughs> I don't know it's just a very weird thing to do on a tv show Mike you spent a lot of time around Carson Wentz who of course was with Indianapolis last year gets traded for a couple third round picks uh to the commanders fair to say it has not gone well for that entire offense this yeah. season what what is what is going on with Carson Wentz? Where is the Carson Wentz we've seen, we saw back in the early stages of his career? Well, I it just, I feel like we're going to just copy-paste what I kind of said here because it's the same kind of deal, right? Like, there's issues offense-wide, but, you know, there's some culpability on him as well. The ball's got to come out quicker. You know, guys are open, and, the, you know, you just saw it right there. There's a guy running wide open underneath. You know, maybe you take what the defense is giving you versus – taking some shots elsewhere. I, you know, I, I just, I feel like this is a guy that needs to have his confidence rebuilt and needs to have it rebuilt consistently to get back to where he was early in his career when he was playing for that team that's chasing him right there. Um, and the way that things were flowing so freely and he's just not there. The feet are all over the place. You can see the lack of confidence just when he's out there. Um, I, this offensive line has to get better. I, I, I know Ron Rivera talked about it as a, as a work in progress. It's, just, it's not year one for these guys, for this regime. It's to the point now where they should be turning the corner, and bringing in Wentz was part of that, and they're just not there just yet. It doesn't make any sense because there's, there's enough weapons around him. This is a really good wide receiving core. you got Logan Thomas at tight end, a former quarterback, that I thought the two of them were really going to click, and uh, I understand Thomas is coming back from an ACL, but it's just I can't believe that they've been so inept on offense. Uh, it's just not something that you really – snap your fingers and all of a sudden it clicks. It's, it's going to take some time and you just wonder if it's going to be too late and if all of a sudden Ron Rivera's got it. I mean, he's been steadfast in his support of Carson Wentz as the quarterback. Taylor Heineke is there as a possibility for a guy who's come in and played That's well before. They don't want to turn that way. They really want to see Wentz turn the corner. It's got to happen soon. Taylor Heineke is a problem because he has come in and played pretty well really like whenever he's come in. And I guess the argument would be that his ceiling is not as high as some other quarterbacks, which I definitely get because if you have a, it's like Cooper Rush argument. Like Cooper Rush is never going to be Dak Prescott. He's just playing really well now. It's like the reason you can't stick with him is because he's not as good as Dak Prescott. That's the reason, right? And I understand that with Taylor Heineke too, except he really has played pretty well in Carson Wentz. That film that you guys just showed was really difficult to watch. Like that was bad. Uh, and for Carson, like, this is going to be a couple... T Sometimes last year he played well, but at the end, not well. La first couple games here, not well. Like, this is, this is a problem, and, you know, what's going to happen is the Heat's going to go to a lot of places in the organization, including Ron Rivera, and then it's like, do they make a change? Do they stick well? Like, it, it gets really, really complicated if he doesn't play better. And they also gave up more than anyone else was willing to give up for Carson Wentz. And there really wasn't a whole lot of interest in Carson Wentz, too, to take on that contract and also give up a couple of significant picks. One other quarterback I want to touch on, Marcus Mariota with the Falcons, who are, once again, second straight season, they're kind of overachieving. I know that there's fantasy people who are frustrated with how Kyle Pitts is being used and whatnot, but, like, they're finding ways to be in every game. They have won uh, a couple of games here, but the passing numbers are so bad on Marcus Mariota. Ian, what would it take? <laughs> what would it take for us to see Desmond Ritter at some point this season? I mean... You know, I, I don't know. It would take, my guess is it would take an injury. 
Um, I think part of the problem with Mariota is he brings so much. And this is a team that's just going to run the heck out of the ball. Um, it's a question that's going to be asked, and, and that's okay. And um, I imagine Arthur Smith, who, you know, likes to tweak some people in his press conferences, will probably have some very, very kind and patient things to say about those kinds of questions. The real issue here is going to be, what if the Falcons aren't bad? Because if they're not bad, and they're actually going to win some games against good teams and maybe be in it, do you stick with Mariota because he's a veteran and knows what he's doing? Do you go to Desmond Ritter, who's a rookie and doesn't know what he's doing, but obviously the ceiling is going to be higher because Mariota's not playing great. Do you stick with Mariota because just he runs well and creates so much? Like, I don't know. But maybe, but you're right. They do look like a team that plays well and hard. They just aren't that talented in some places. Well, at, at Tampa Bay, San Francisco, at Cincinnati. Three good teams. Right. Three right. good defenses. This is a really important right. stretch for Marcus Mariota coming up because then after that, Carolina, Chargers, okay, tough one. At Carolina, so it's Carolina sandwiched around a uh, uh, Chargers game. Chicago at Washington, Pittsburgh. I mean, there's, there's an opening mm. there. If you wanted to get a young guy in and play against some defenses that aren't as stout as some other teams and some teams that aren't – uh, as good as some other teams, there's your window right here. So I, I would say, Marcus Mariota, the next three weeks are incredibly important for you to play better football. And I know that there's frustration inside that building with some of his decision-making, and they feel like there's plays that can be made, that should be made, that haven't been made. So uh, here we go for the next couple of weeks for Marcus Mariota. We've also got some other quarterback questions thanks to injuries in places like New England, as well as with the New York Giants. Let's touch on some of those big injuries to watch here leading up to week five. Also get to our big surprises and disappointments so far at this almost quarter pole of the NFL season. Stick around. Some of the injuries to keep an eye on as we head into week five here. Russell Wilson. Listed as limited, it's an estimated practice report, but of course they got that Thursday night game. My understanding is he's got some tendonitis in the shoulder, not expected to be a big issue. He should be good to go against the Colts. Indianapolis with a couple of questions. Shaquille Leonard, we already know he's out, got a concussion and broke his nose last week. He's not going to play. Jonathan Taylor, that is still up in the air. All the tests came back clean, but that's going to be one to watch. Daniel Jones with that ankle injury. Giants are still calling him day to day as Ian reported. On Monday uh, in Atlanta, Cordero Patterson's going to miss at least the next four games. So certainly some opportunities for some of those other guys that I'm sure everyone by now has picked up on their fantasy team. And one of the best stories, hopefully, here, Brian Robinson getting medically cleared, the commander's running back who was shot twice back in August. Ron Rivera hopeful that this is going to give them a little bit of a spark. It certainly seemed like that he was going to be a big part of that offense prior to that unfortunate incident. All right. So we are here four games into the season. This is usually the early, probably too early evaluation mode. But let's start out with Mike here. Your biggest okay. surprise and your biggest disappointment to this point in the 2022 NFL season, Mike. Uh, I'm going to go biggest surprise, and it's it's rough timing because he's sidelined right now. But it, it's Tua Tagovailoa, and I, I know some folks are saying, what are you surprised about? This is a guy that's been a successful quarterback Back to Alabama even before that. Yeah, I, I understand that. But, you know, it, he doesn't have the smoothest throwing motion. He, he's We question his arm strength. And you get this offense coming in with these guys, Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle, that you want to hit down the field. And you said, how's this going to work? Well, it's been working. And, you know, hopefully he gets back, he gets healthy, and let's see more of this because more power to you, Tua. Now, now I'm rooting for you. I, I'm not that I'm rooting against you, but now, you know, hey, you showed me you can do it, so let's see how much more we can do. The Dolphins were fun, but take care of your head first. Don't worry about going, uh, getting back on the football field. Take care of yourself as a human being first. Uh, my biggest disappointment so far, and this is not to say that they're dead and buried right now, is the Detroit Lions because I watched Hard Knocks. I got fired up. I saw uh, the way that Dan Campbell was motivating this team, and who could not like Dan Campbell? Who could not... Uh, who could watch Hard Knocks and not say, oh, man, I want that guy to succeed. I want this coaching staff to succeed. And it just hasn't been so far. And it's disappointing because three of their first four games were at home. So you're saying, wait a second, could the Lions possibly pop out to a 3-1 and one start? Eh. 
It's been a one and three start. So all this hope that we had coming into the season, mm. it comes to be that the soothing light at the end of their tunnel was just a freight train coming their way. That was very, very poetic and, you know, whatever. Um, all right, I'll do me next. Uh, my biggest disappointment is the Raiders, who are one and three. But I think we're going to be better. And I know starting 0 and 3 is bad, and generally it doesn't mean you're going to make the playoffs. I think, I really think they're going to be fine. They lost two weird ones. You know, Hunter Renfro doesn't get concussed and fumble at the end. They probably end up beating the Cardinals. Like, I think, I think the Raiders are going to be fine. I really do. I think they'll get back to 500 at some point, like before December, and end up as a playoff team still. But disappointing the way it started. And, you know, I know there were some people in there who were nervous about last year kind of overachieving. Everyone expects that, but now they've kind of underachieved. So one and three, I think they'll end up being fine, but that's my disappointment. Biggest surprise has got to be the Giants. They are kind of good. And I know they're not talented and they have no receivers and they lost Sterling Shepard, so they even more have no receivers and they got a lot of issues and they're kind of fun to watch and they work really hard and Saquon looks awesome. Um, like, he is a really good player. I think we all forgot because he's been injured. I kind of like watching the Giants, um, and that's been my biggest surprise. For my biggest surprise, I, I got to go with Geno Smith. And I know that we saw him play some pretty good football while Russell Wilson was out a year ago. But right now, Geno with the Seahawks is completing over 77% of his passes. It's the highest completion percentage through the first four games of the season of anyone in NFL history. Six touchdown passes, two interceptions, a 108 passer rating. Pete Carroll has praised him. And this is a guy who, if Drew Locke doesn't get COVID, may well not be the starting quarterback for the Seahawks going into the season. They're obviously going to be challenged. The defense last week against those Lions, this is not what we're used to seeing from Pete Carroll defense. And obviously losing Jamal Adams forces them to adjust in a lot of different ways. But Geno Smith, who we hadn't seen been a full star full-time starting quarterback in, what, seven years or so, has stepped in and passes the eye test and looks like uh, he's a legitimate starting quarterback. On the flip side of things, the biggest disappointment to this point in the season, to me, has to be the Panthers' offense. They just can't score. And in the past couple of years, they've had a variety of different excuses with the quarterbacks and Christian McCaffrey's injuries. Well, McCaffrey, even though he's on the injury report every week, has been playing for them. They went out and they traded for Baker Mayfield. I wore a Baker Mayfield shirt on the first episode of this show. It just hasn't clicked. Yeah. Mayfield hasn't played well. They can't put up points to stay in games. And the stat on Matt Rule that I tweeted the other day, the Panthers are now 1-26 in under Matt Rule when the opponent scores at least 17 points, including 24 losses in a row. In other words, the Panthers right now can only win one way, which is an ugly game, a defense-driven game. If they could just generate some offense, if they could be average offensively, they'd be a pretty good team because that defense is so good and they actually do have yeah. weapons on the offensive side. But just no momentum going. I thought that they would come out hotter. Get, we'll give them this. Ben McAdoo, new play caller, new system. Take some time on that. But not the start that I think a lot of us, including me, were expecting to see from Carolina. Yeah. That is it for us. You can catch the insiders every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday streaming on fast platforms as well as the NFL app. Catch every episode after it's posted on the NFL's YouTube page. We'll be back for another episode tomorrow talking about all things week five, including the games that we're excited to see. For Ian Rappaport and Mike Garofolo, I'm Tom Pellicero. See you.